Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of KISS Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. If you're enjoying these podcasts, please take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever platform you're listening on and leave me a rating and review. This is really helpful and allows me to keep producing good content for free by drawing on more of the top names in the industry to the show. In addition, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter on our homepage at www.kisorganics.com to find out when the latest blog posts and podcasts are available. This week's podcast is all about blue mats, a unique way to irrigate your plants. Blue mats use no electricity and are an affordable way to improve the way you water your plants. We are using them in our greenhouse beds and have helped many growers in setting up custom systems for their gardens. After listening to the show, send us an email at TAD, that's TAD, at KISorganics.com if you're interested and we can help you get a setup for yourself, or just send me an email through our website contact page. Our guest this week is Steve Troy. Steve is a longtime gardener and has been around cannabis for decades. He is the North American distributor for Blue Mats, and he is here to give us insight in how Blue Mats work and how to properly use them in your garden. Well, thanks, Steve. I really appreciate you taking the time today to come on the show. Oh, sure. It's good talking, Ted. Yeah, so I wanted to start off and give listeners a little bit of a background into uh, your life history before we start talking about Blue Mats and Irrigation. Can you share a little bit more about what kind of path you went on that led you down to uh, starting Sustainable Village? Oh, sure. I Well, I guess it starts back in the early days of the 60s, like the mid-1960s. I was in a Peace Corps type program in a remote part of Mexico. And um, there was no power or running water or anything in the little village where I was staying. And we worked on projects there, including um, aquaponics and um, kind of fish farming and sanitation projects and energy projects. And it just was really interesting and kind of started me on a whole life path of of things that were environmental, energy saving, corporate technology, alternative energy, and things like that. And pretty much I've been doing it ever since. Now, you mentioned to me before we started the podcast that you've actually been running uh, small businesses or starting businesses for uh, almost 60 years, you said. Is that right? Probably a little bit more than that, yeah. I think since uh, yeah, the mid-1950s, probably. I've started probably... 55 or 60 different businesses. Wow. So how did that path lead you to uh, Blue Mats? Well, you know, as part of the back to the land movement in the, in the late 60s, I, I was living in the Bay Area and Berkeley and uh, San Francisco. And there was a whole big movement up north to Mendocino and Humboldt County. And so I was part of that and um, moved up to Humboldt and I had my first uh, marijuana farm in 1971. <laughs> okay. And um, it was just really intriguing. And then I I was I became a partner in a natural food store up there in Garberville. And we had, um, it was kind of like a cultural center because back in the, those days, there was a real contrast conflict between the kind of younger, more counterculture people and the old um, loggers and conservative people that were there. So, our natural food store kind of became a kind of a community center in a way. And, and people would always ask us to get things that they needed. And so, I mean, it was real interesting. We had, I mean, and the main way people made money then was uh, growing marijuana. And so we had all these customers coming in, buying grains and herbs and torn jeans, barefooted, torn t-shirts and hundred dollar bills kind of falling out of their pockets as they would walk up and down the aisles. (laughs) <laughs> and so they'd say, hey, can you get us some uh, drip tubing or how about some um, organic fertilizers? And I, some, I need some rock phosphate and some granite dust and some bat guano. And, and so we started getting all these things for people, deer fencing, and um, irrigation products. And um, it got so so big, I started another store called Open Circle up there that was all just, I think it might have been the first 
store oriented towards marijuana farming. It's the first one I've ever heard of or knew about, at least. And so we started doing all kinds of products for, for grower supplies. And um, that was just, it was just uh, going crazy. We wound up, but we had, a, then we started another store in Willits, and another store in Ukiah, and then one in um, Santa Rosa. And so that was all just, um, we were just on this really steep, fast growing curve. And then the uh, war on drugs started. And at first it was pretty mellow. They would, um, you know, pull a few plants and let them keep the rest. And, you know, it's no big deal. But then they started becoming soldiers and helicopters and really serious bad news things. And, and they started, uh, I mean, we used to, in those days, we used to sell miles and miles of uh, polypipe tubing to go from, creeks and springs to people's gardens, remote gardens. And then when they started using the helicopters, they used, they started uh, following the water lines to find out where people's gardens were. And that's when I first discovered blue mats. And um, with an idea of instead of having these kind of telltale breadcrumb, Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs going to the gardens, people could just put a 55 gallon drum under some trees and then just go up there every week or two and fill it up and have blue mats water their plants. So that's that's how uh, blue mats first started. That was, I think, around 1979, 1980. Wow. So you've been doing this for a long time. And the blue mat technology has changed, I know, over the last few decades. But can you talk a little bit more about what blue mats are? So this isn't something that you invented. You're the, uh, as I understand it, you're the North American distributor for this product, but it comes out of, is it Austria? Right. Yeah. They're manufactured in Austria. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, what they are? And uh... well, they're basically, uh, yeah, they're basically just a really inexpensive tensiometer that um, moisture, soil moisture sensing connected to a little valve. So it's manual and inexpensive compared to tensiometers and electronic valves. So, so they basically uh, turn the water on and off based on the whatever moisture level you set them for. So um, it just prevents the soil from being too wet or too dry automatically without timers or batteries or electricity. So for our listeners who haven't heard of blue mats, I just want to clarify this a little bit. Uh, What they are essentially, it looks like a little, kind of we call them carrots, but they look kind of like a carrot and they have a little knob on top that's adjustable and a ceramic tip. And that ceramic tip works, as you mentioned, as a tensiometer. So it measures the moisture tension in the soil. And then based on where you set that adjustable nozzle, it determines whether or not that device, the blue mat, is going to release more water out into the drip line or uh, retain water if it's too moist. So it's an automatic watering system that uses no electricity. It's completely mechanical. Is there anything else you would add to that definition? Well, I... I think it helps that I always think of it a little bit like a, a valve attached to a piston, like in a car. So the, but instead of the piston going up and down, the water goes up and down. So they're filled with water, and when the when the soil around the ceramic tip starts to dry out, it pulls that water down a little bit, which takes the pressure off of the valve and opens the water. Then when the water gets down and it gets moist again, it stops that that pull and um, closes the valve. I've never heard that def- that analogy. I really like that. So how how would someone go about using this this technology? So you have this carrot that's hooked up to a drip line or this blue mat, sorry. Uh, how, how many drippers or how, how much drip tape or something would you be able to use per carrot or per blue mat? Well... I mean, there's a really huge difference. You you know, they can go anywhere from just a, a few drops a minute to many gallons a minute. So the ideal way is to put the pot or the bed or whatever you're trying to water, get it at the, the moisture level that you think is the best, and then set it, and then it keeps it there. So so it's it's important because otherwise if you – if you if you set them when the soil is too wet, then it keeps it too wet. You keep it when it's set it when it's too dry, then it keeps it too dry. So the ideal way to use them is to uh, get get your planting mix or your bed to the moisture level you want to maintain, and then just set it and it keeps it there. 
Yeah, and I think that's a big advantage to these blue mat systems versus other irrigation systems. Um, unless you're spending you know, tens of thousands of dollars on an automatic system that's functioning off of tensiometers, most people are just putting in a drip system and then regulating it by a computer or turning it on and off manually themselves or putting it on a timer. And that the advantage of the blue mat is it, it regulates that moisture content and maintains it. I think there's this uh, myth in the cannabis industry that these wet dry cycles are really good for your plant. But if we're talking about organic soil where the microbes are cycling nutrients and making those nutrients plants available, the ideal vi environment for these microbes is really soil that's at optimal moisture content. Uh, that's why I think watering is th one of the most important things in your garden. And I think it gets uh, underappreciated for how much it can affect yield and, and the health of your plant and also reduce plant stress. So I, I think that's a really good point you brought up regarding the fact that these blue mats maintain that moisture content for you. Are there any, any other advantages to these blue mat systems over a conventional irrigation system or, or drip, drip system that you want to highlight? Well, I'd say what, what you just described is, is really beneficial for organic growing and especially uh, living soil techniques where you're you really need to maintain an even moisture level because if it gets too wet or too dry, the microbes and a lot of the beneficials can go dormant and um, stop working. But but even in the, in the conventional systems or not organic systems, if if the soil gets too wet, for example, it stops the transpiration because uh, pumps kind of work on a similar kind of uh, physics principle as the blue mats do. They they pull the moisture and the nutrients in the roots up into the leaves. And for that to work right, it's similar to what I described with the blue mats there. And if there's, if there's, um, if the soil is too wet, it prevents that, um, pull, the transpiration pull and the plants, um, even if there's plenty of nutrients in the soil, it won't go to the plant. So overwatering is something I think uh, people in general don't, understand. I mean, everybody has had the kind of the traumatic experience of a plant dying because they didn't give it enough water. And so there's a tendency to kind of overcompensate and give too much water. And um, there's definitely some really big drawbacks to the soil being too wet too. Yeah, that's a good point. And I love that you can dial in that moisture content where you want it. So we also use your digital moisture meters as an, a quick and easy way to get a moisture reading so that we can quantify what we like our soils at. Now, for us, we like to keep our soils right around 100 MBAR, which I know is wetter than most traditional soils, even cannabis soils. Uh, so depending on what your media is that you're growing is, you can determine what that optimal moisture content level is using a moisture meter, and then take that information and set up your blue mats around that around an actual number. So you're not just guessing at what optimal moisture is, you can actually set it, which to me is huge. Right, right. And and that's when you can kind of dial in based on the kind of growing method you have. So so we usually recommend in a veg to keep it between 120 and 150 no bars and then any flower between 150 and 180. But if you're doing organics, especially living soil, you're not just thinking about the plant roots, but you're thinking about the whole, whole soil mixture and the microbes and microvilli and all the different beneficials are in there. So, so keeping it more moist, and especially if you're using a mulch and you want, because the mulch needs to be moist enough for the earthworms to be able to come up and eat it. So, if um, so, a lot of times people will keep it um, even even more moist than 100, even 80 to 90, if um, if you're using like a living soil kind of environment. Yeah, and it's important to note that I always confuse these in my head, but the, the millibars, uh, as you go uh, lower in numbers, like you said, um, towards 80 or 90, that soil gets uh, more moist or wetter. And as right. the number goes higher, you're actually, the soil's drier. And it's just, for me, that's a hard connection to make, but I think it's important people realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of intuitively, people tend to think the other way around. Yeah. But. Yeah. And I like to keep a couple moisture meters. If you're, if you're growing commercially, as, as in you're making a living on your crop, and I like to have at least two or three or, or more digital moisture meters. So in case one fails or I have um, anything go, go off, 
I have a redundancy there just in case because that the the digital moisture meters are electronic; they can break, and so having something uh, to check your results on, I think, is really handy. Make sure they're calibrated. That's just another suggestion I like to throw out to people. Yeah, some some we have some customers that use one per each plant, but that gets pretty expensive. And, but I think I think it's good to have one at least for each different size pot. So if you have some plants in five gallon and you have some plants in thirty gallon. You know, it's good to have a, a a moisture meter in each, and you can move them around, but it but it takes about five or ten minutes to get an accurate accurate reading after you move one. So it's a kind of a budgetary thing too. It's uh, most convenient to have one per plant, but if the budget's not there, then it, you just have to be a little bit more patient. Then you can take one and move it from place to place. Yeah, and even if you can't go the, you know, let's say the blue mats are out of your or budget then uh, even getting a digital moisture meter so that you can start to dial in your watering habits is another way to go. Uh, And I do like to caution people, we've had this problem in the past, is that the top of the digital moisture meter is not waterproof. So we don't want to, you don't want to water over the top of it or it can break it. And that's something that uh, we've learned the hard way, as you know, uh, with these moisture meters. So I just want to let people know ahead of time in case they do pick one up and start using one in their garden. I don't know if you noticed, but we have a cap that goes on the top of it to prevent that. No, I didn't know that. I might have to start ordering that with them. Yeah, they're pretty handy. They're only, I think, $2 retail. And then you can even use them outside, and it doesn't matter if it rains or uh, water gets on them. It just protects the electronics in the top. Very cool. I'm going to have to order some of those for you for the moisture meters that we have. That's great. I'm glad I'm glad I learned something today there. Oh, good. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit more about uh, the actual usage of these of these blue mats. So they come in a couple different sizes. You have the what you're calling, I believe, the regular size. And then you have a uh, maxi, which is a a larger carrot, essentially. Uh, Can you talk about when you might use those two systems or those two? Well, well, we actually have about five different sizes or types. There's we have the the five inch and the nine inch you just talked about. We also uh, make a sixteen inch size. Oh, and then then we make uh, for really big pots and beds. And then we also have a small one. We we call it a, a bonsai blue mat, but it's real short and stubby. And then you can put that in really small pots. And then there's another one that we call it a surface blue mat. It's got about a three inch base, and that's really handy for starts and clones and you can um, do capillary mat systems with that, which are just starting to get popular in the U.S. They're really um, common and popular in Europe, but it's a really inexpensive way of of watering a you know a whole lot of um, small starts and clones and anywhere up to like a one gallon or so size. Now, as a general rule, I've always used the regular blue mat size, the five inch and I've only gone up to the nine inch if I have more than a foot of depth in my soil. That's sort of been my general rule for it. Do you have uh, guidelines that you like to give listeners or, or people regarding them? Well, we usually use just the small ones up to 10 gallon size pot. And then a 10 gallon and up, I, I like to, well, at least 10 and 15, I like to use one of each because if, you, if it's that deep, then it's kind of nice to, then you're moder- monitoring both the, the top half of the planting mix and the bottom half. Yeah, so the big difference between the two is where that ceramic tip is sitting in the soil profile. So the maxi obviously reaches deeper into the soil. So it's going to be measuring your water, your moisture content at, you know, whatever, seven or eight inches instead of the other one, which is measuring, I'm guessing, around three or four inches. Um, right. So that, the that's other, the big the other difference. Thing, the other thing you can do with the big ones is you can put them in horizontally. If you have a, like, especially if it's like a hundred gallon or even 50 gallon size, and if it's really deep, you can you can put it horizontally, and then you can uh, sense the moisture at any any level during mix. Yeah, you know we experimented with that and didn't have as great of success because one of the challenges we had with these blue mats is uh, if you bump them at all or you bump the line attached to them, it can throw off the sensor and they can start. They think that the moisture content is low, and so they'll start just pushing out water and pushing out water. Um, can right. you talk a little bit about that? The um... Well, you don't want to, if you're going to put them in horizontally, you don't want to have it sticking out into a walkway. Because yeah. then people will bump it and you know, get a runaway really easy. So 
it's if you do it horizontally, it's better to position it on a side where you don't walk in between. So, so you don't have that happen. So let's talk a little bit about some of the potential problems you might have in, with a blue mat system. And one of those I just briefly mentioned, but I, you know, I've used blue mats myself in my test garden and I've flooded a couple pots because I didn't make that good connection there in the soil. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that when you're putting in the blue mats, the carrots themselves into the soil? Well, one of the most um, most important things to watch out for, I guess, is if you if there's a lot of um, perlite, especially the big chunky perlite or volcanic rock or anything that's uh, really porous like that in the soil. If if that's touching the ceramic tip, then you can fake it out. You can make the blue mat think it's dry when it's not really, and get a runaway. So, but it, but it's a pretty easy thing to prevent. You just if you just take some wet uh, peat moss or cocoa and uh, put it in the soil. So just as long as there's something in between the, the volcanic rock or perlite and the, and, the, and the sensor, then it avoids that. It's kind of the same thing with rock wool or, or other kinds of media like that. It, you just need to have something that will prevent that fake out for the blue mat, thinking it's dry when it's not. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And then I think also making sure, like you mentioned, that all of your lines and everything else are not in walkways or areas that they could get bumped. Because if you bump it, now you're potentially moving a spot of the ceramic tip that's now touching air and creates that same situation. So, Right. And again, it's a really easy fix, but if you don't know it, then you don't do it. But if you bump if you bump a carrot, then if you don't do anything, you get a runaway. But if you just push the soil down, around it just so, to make sure that, that, that there's a good connection between the ceramic tip and the potting mix that prevents it. The other thing that's happened, so if I can go on this, is like I think probably doing tech support, probably 80 to 90% of the problems we hear come from people doing uh, gravity systems and forgetting to uh, refill the, the reservoir. Oh. And because... If that it, if you catch it right away, then it's not a big deal. You just refill the reservoir and you're still going good. But if it if it stays dry for too long, the the water in the carrot can get sucked out. And again, it depends on how quickly you catch it. If you catch it pretty fast, then you can just refill the the carrot and you're good to go. But if it if it goes for too long of a time, you, it gets too dried out. And if you just fill it up, it won't work properly. So. If it dries out for too long, you need to soak it again and get started again, or else you can uh, have that kind of problem. That's really interesting. I hadn't heard of that, but then I'm not dealing with as many Blue Mat customers as you are. So <laughs> right. let's talk a little bit about that. Like how you mentioned soaking the ceramic tip portion prior to setting up your system. Can you go into sort of what that process looks like? Well, well, one thing that I think can really avoid the problem you described too is um, making sure that the water that you put the carrot that you soak the carrot in and fill it with doesn't have any dissolved oxygen in it, because a lot of times uh, cities, I mean, it's different in different places, but a lot of times cities will use oxygen to pressurize their system, and there's lots of dissolved oxygen, and if you fill a carrot with that dissolved oxygen, it will over the course of a few days, form bubbles. And if there's just a few bubbles, it's not that big of a deal. It just kind of increases the on-off cycle when it turns on and when it turns it off. But if there's too many air bubbles in there, then you can get a runaway and it just won't, won't turn off. So what I always like to do is um, boil the water first and then let it cool and then use that water to fill the carrots because then you're, you're assured that there's not a dissolved oxygen that will create air bubbles and um, change your setting. That's a really great suggestion. You know, I when I was setting up my system, I didn't do that, but I let it sit in the water for, I think, two or three days, which I think allowed a lot of the oxygen to be removed from the water, but I, didn't, I wasn't even aware of that. So uh, that's a really good suggestion. And on top of that, it's not a lot of water that we're talking about because these carrots are not huge. So it, it wouldn't be a big deal no. to throw a pot on the on a stove and, and boil a little bit of water to soak them in. No, it doesn't take long. And then the basic thing for soaking them, it's kind of gone down. We used to think you needed to soak them for at least an hour or so, but but now we've discovered and the factory has confirmed that you really only need to do it for 10 or 15 minutes. But 
you need to do it 10 or 15 minutes, both with it in two piece. And then when you screw it together underwater, you need to soak it for another 10 or 15 minutes. So, so it doesn't, not a good idea to just uh, soak it for a long time, screw it on and then use it right away. You, you need to have another little 10 minutes or something in there for the, for things to equalize inside the carrot. Okay. So you're going to soak the carrots and then attach the top part, which has the valve on it. And there'll be photos and everything on the podcast page for people who and design information and everything there. But you'll screw on the top of the carrot underwater so that we're not getting right. any air bubbles in there. And that's an important uh, part of this. And then at that point, that one, that particular blue mat is ready to go and we can put it right into the soil. Uh, well, you need to soak it again for another 10 minutes after you screw it together. Yes. So so the ideal minimum is to take it apart, soak it underwater for 10 or 15 minutes, then take a pipette or um, a, a dropper and squeeze. The, there's a little few air bubbles inside the top. There's three little holes in the top. So if you squeeze the pipette into that, it's, those air bubbles come out and then screw it together. And then wait 10 or 10 or 15 minutes, and then it's good to go. And once that's done, you can leave it in the water for weeks or even longer. And anytime you need it, it's ready to go. Okay, and then we take that carrot, and we can push it down into the soil wherever it is that we want to be monitoring the moisture tension around the plants. Right. And mm -hmm. make sure to push it all the way down till the cap is the only thing exposed. Um, I didn't. I made that mistake on one of mine. I didn't push it all the way into the soil, so I think that's an important thing to point out too. Well, that kind of depends on, I guess, a lot of on the humidity. Like in in some some places, like especially if people are they're going to transplant from a small pot into a big one, and so they want to use the long carrots, but they don't want to get one for the small one and one for the big one. They'll, they'll just put the a long carrot a nine inch one into a small pot, like a two or three gallon or even, and then, um, then just put when it, maybe it's only halfway pushed down. And then when you put it into a bigger pot, push it further. But that, that works in places where there's high humidity, but in places where it's drier, then you'll, that, that will, you'll, um, suck some of the water out of the carrot. If it, if it's exposed like that, I guess it depends on the temperature too. Okay, so if we then put the carrot into the soil and uh, hooked up all the, the main line to it, the, the 10 millimeter line, we then can, uh, once the whole system is set up, we then have that valve on top that we can open up, right? Can you talk a little bit about how that process works with, you already mentioned getting the soil to field capacity or whatever your optimal uh, moisture content is for that soil. Before, as you go to dial in the system, can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Well, well, the standard suggestion is to open up the top until the water is coming out, and then dial it down until there's just a hanging drop, and then dial it down one or two more of the little triangles that are circled, the little cap on the top. But the, but that also depends a little bit on the kind of planting mix people have, and the kind of growing method they have too. So. If um, so, so like we like we talked before about living soil, you, and, and if you want to keep more of the pot moist, then then maybe you w wouldn't turn it down at all. You might just just go at the the hanging drop level, and then if there's uh, more uh, sand and perlite and things that have more drainage, then you might want to keep it a little bit more open too. And but if there's something with more um, capillary action in the soil mix, then you might want to turn it down a little bit more because it will spread out by itself more evenly. It, you know, there's, there's different rule of thumb ideas, but um, every situation is different. The temperature and the humidity in the room and the kind of plant and how fast things are growing. And so, so it's basically um, needs to be customized to the site. That's where that digital moisture meter, I think comes in handy. You know, we, with our soil, what I did was exactly what you described is, you know, I put the carrot in, I watched till that dry, it would start dripping. And then I would turn it, I would slowly close that valve on top until that drip was just hanging 
right there and then i would turn it back one notch but that's after i've gotten the soil i do it after i've, I've watered the soil to get it and then i wait a few hours until i have it at you know evenly homogeneous and at the moisture content i want it at and then i go through that process of, of going down and dialing in all the blue mats and uh for me that worked really well yeah that's the ideal way to do it other, the other thing i think that's kind of good to know is if if people don't do it that way and they put it in when it's when the soil is too wet or too dry and then they want to uh, adjust it later it's really important to not do that too much if you make it drier or make it a little bit more wet you don't need to turn it very much because it's like a 24-hour system where we're used to watering all at one time pretty much even with a drip system and so what you see coming out you kind of gauge by how much you turn it down but with Blue mats, because it's this long-term thing, you, if you want to make it a little wetter or drier, it's good to maybe only do two or three of those little lines in between the triangles. Otherwise, you kind of go from being too dry to doing too wet, and you're kind of always going back and forth. It's hard to find that middle ground. Yeah, you can definitely start playing around with it and make the situation a lot worse. I've done that a couple times, too, as well. So, like you said, it's just micro adjustments. That's what those notches on top are for on the on the top of the valve, and that make it really easy. Once you have it dialed in, I have to say it works exceptionally well. Well, it's fun to walk into the room and see that you know some of the blue mats are watering and some of them aren't, depending on you know the particular plant and stage of growth, and you know different cultivars in the room will all require different water. So it really optimizes for each plant and each container or each bed. And I, I know it works. I had a customer a few years ago that uh, had just some plants, a medical garden in, in a tent. And he actually went to Alaska to go uh, fishing and just had his wife refilling the reservoir every day or every couple of days for his plants. And he came back and his plants were actually touching the light. He showed me photos and they were all burnt on the top canopy. But the issue was definitely not watering. The plants were healthy. They had just overgrown the space. But uh, knowing that these things can function and optimally water without a lot of human intervention and any electricity is really amazing. Oh, it saves so much time. I've had probably uh, three or four people tell me that um, it saved their their marriage or their relationship, <laughs> that their girlfriends or their wives were so fed up with them having to be there every day and spend so much time doing that. They were about ready to leave and, and uh, the, the blue mats uh, saved their relationship. You know, I could see that. I'm terrible about remembering to water, too, if I have a bunch of other things going on. And then I'll water at my convenience, not necessarily when the plants need it. Keeping in mind, though, that I've never had to rely on a cash crop for my, you know, for my salary, for example. If I was, you know, growing commercially, then that would be a different story. But if, if you just have a medical garden or something like that, yeah, it takes a lot of time. If you have another job or other things going on in your life. So have, be, the more you can automate and the more labor you can save, it more than pays for itself. Plus, you're reducing the amount of water you're using, which is huge. And even if you're there every day and you're not going to go on vacation like for a week or two, it's still there's a lot of better ways you can spend your time than hand watering, you know, trimming and watching for bugs or plant things. Or I mean, there's just so many more beneficial things you can spend your time doing than just watering, spending that much time watering. And I, I think it's even more of a factor now with uh, with legalization becoming um, broader and more prevalent because um, the with the with the prices being driven down, you can't really change much about the selling price, but you can, where you really have leverage is limiting your costs. So if you do something that both saves a lot in your labor costs and also at the same time increases your yield, that's kind of a really, I think, um, successful way of dealing with the uh, lower prices that are out there already and probably going to be more that way in the future. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, reducing expenses is a lot easier than trying to sell more products. So in ways we can reduce our expenses or put that labor towards more, um, more efficient or more effective uses is, is great. Now, unfortunately, we got cut off at this point in the conversation and have not had a chance to reconnect. I have decided to post the podcast as it stands and would encourage listeners to email me with any questions they may have on blue mats or irrigation in general, and I can follow up with Steve in another podcast episode. 
Again, that was Steve Troy, the North American distributor of Blue Mat's automatic watering systems. Now I realize if this is your first time hearing about Blue Mats, or you've never set up a system before, this can seem a bit daunting. Plus, every situation is different, so it requires a custom setup. I'll have some examples and photos on our podcast page to help, but please shoot me an email through our Kiss Organics website contact page, and we can help you avoid any mistakes and get exactly what you need to try it out. You are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. Don't forget that there's more information articles available on our website and blog at www.kisorganics.com, as well as links to the data and information we discussed in this episode on the podcast page. And if you enjoy these podcasts, please take a moment to leave me a rating and review on iTunes or send me your feedback and suggestions through our website contact page. Thanks for listening.